hear each man our own language in which we were born. Parthians and Medes and Elamites and those dwelling in Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya adjoining Cyrene, visitors from both Rome, Jews, proselytes, these are converts to Judaism who weren't even Jewish by blood, the proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, listen, we hear them babbling incoherently ecstatic utterances. We hear them uttering all kinds of gibberish, we don't know what they're saying. That's not what they said. We hear them speaking in our languages, our tongues, the wonderful works of God. Did they know what they were saying? They were speaking real languages of the world for the purpose of preaching the gospel. You see, when man rebelled against God, he cursed their tongues and it became confusion and babbling. When the Holy Spirit was poured out, it reversed the confusion. Now there's comprehension. They understand the story of Jesus being the Messiah. Thousands were converted during that week, 3,000 then, 5,000 a few days later. They then go away from the feast. They fan out across the Roman Empire. They take back to their respective countries the truth that the Messiah had come. His name was Jesus. So the Jews were the first ones to spread the gospel around the world because they heard it in their own tongue. The Lord had to do something miraculous to give them that ability to be able to preach the gospel everywhere, right? That's the gift of tongues. What you're seeing in millions of churches around the world masquerading as the gift of tongues is really rank paganism that has found its way in to the church and has caused confusion. And again I want to emphasize good people, dear people, some of them are here today. I know some are listening that have come out of these churches like myself that are being confused by this. Now I said there's three examples of speaking in tongues in the Bible. The other example is Cornelius. And I'm not going to have time to read all these in depth. If you read in Acts chapter 10, you'll read where Cornelius was a Roman centurion. Now the gospel is going to the Gentiles. This is after the stoning of Stephen. Peter goes to this house. It's the first time he's preaching to a Gentile. Cornelius is a centurion from the Italian band. What language do you think they spoke? Latin, Italian, right? He's got servants in his household. The servants in the Roman Empire were, could be from anywhere. They spoke other languages. Peter, who speaks Jewish now, is being invited by the servants in Cornelius' household to go and angel said, Peter's going to come and he's going to teach to you. Peter begins to talk. They understand partially what he's saying. It's not their native tongue. While Peter is preaching about Jesus in Aramaic, the Holy Spirit falls upon them. Verse, uh, Acts chapter 10 verse 44. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on them which heard the word. Those who were of the circumcision which believed were astonished because as many as came with Peter, the, the Jews who had come, were surprised that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost for they heard them speak with tongues. That means they understood them speaking with tongues and magnify God. That means they could understand what they were saying in those tongues. They were magnifying God. They weren't just babbling. Does that make sense? The same way the Holy Spirit was poured out in Acts chapter 10 is the same gift that you find in Acts chapter 2. If you don't believe Pastor Doug, you read in verse 15, Peter, and this is chapter 11 of Acts, Acts chapter 11 verse 15, you might want to look that up. When Peter reports back to the council in Jerusalem how God is now sending the Holy Spirit on the Gentiles, listen to what Peter says. The Holy Ghost fell on them as it fell on us at the beginning. So what kind of gift of tongues do they get in Acts chapter 10? Something new? A new variety? Or is it the same kind of gift of tongues Peter says that we had at the beginning? Right? It's languages that could be understood. Then you've got the third example of speaking in tongues that you're going to find in uh, Acts chapter 19. This also is a place where it talks about uh, rebaptism. The 12 Ephesian disciples. We all know that Jesus had 12 Jewish disciples. Do you know after the gospel went to the Gentiles? You find a story where there's 12 Gentile disciples. Acts 19, Paul preaches to these uh, 12 Ephesians who were baptized by John the Baptist. They had not heard the story about Jesus yet. He preaches to them about Jesus. He lays hands upon them. I'm in Acts 19 verse 6. 
the Holy Ghost came on them and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Now what does prophesied mean? It means they preached. Prophesied doesn't mean you walk around giving astrological fortune cookies. Uh, prophesied means that you preach. And so could they understand what they were saying in these tongues? Yeah, it says they were prophesying. They were preaching. Were there different language groups present? You've got Paul, you've got Luke, you've got Ephesians. So there's several language groups that are present there. They needed the gift of tongues. They recognized there was a difference of tongues. The very fact that Luke doesn't say the Holy Spirit fell on them a whole different way. They got a different kind of gift of tongues. He doesn't say that. Which means it's the same kind of gift of tongues that you saw in Acts chapter 10 and that you saw in Acts chapter 2. There you have it friends. We've looked at all of the examples of speaking in tongues in the Bible and nowhere do you see an example of this incoherent muttering and babbling where the person speaking may not even know what they're saying. There is a counterfeit that has been introduced. For every truth of God for every truth of God, Satan has a counterfeit. Is there counterfeit love? Is there a counterfeit for uh, the Holy Spirit? You can bet there is. Does God have a counterfeit law? Counterfeit Sabbath? He's got counterfeits, uh, the, the devil I mean. The devil's got a counterfeit for every truth of God. Shouldn't surprise us that he not only has a counterfeit for tongues. There's a true gift of tongues. I want to reiterate, I believe in all the gifts of the Spirit. I believe in miracles. I believe in healing. I believe in casting out devils. I believe in prophecy. I believe in all the gifts of the Spirit. But there's been a, a, a cuckoo bird egg that's been laid in the church. That is not the gift of tongues. God is not the author of confusion the pandemonium and the bedlam and the cacophony of noise that's done in the name of the Lord. By any definition, the disjointed, repetitive uh, gibberish that you often hear is not a language. I I'll tell you another little study that was done by these same gentlemen from New York who did a, the study on tongues. They took an excerpt of somebody speaking in tongues in a worship service, got a clear recording, and they went to a hundred different charismatic ministers that believe that they had the gift of tongues and they went under the guise of we're Christians and we got a recording of someone speaking in tongues and we'd like to know what this message is. They play the tape and the pastor would say oh this saith the Lord and he'd say what the message was and they'd write it down. They took the same tape of someone speaking in tongues to a hundred different ministers. Guess how many different interpretations there were? One hundred different interpretations. Which makes it a very dubious or a suspicious gift. If the devil was going to counterfeit the Holy Spirit and he was going to try and market it, would he want you to feel bad or would he want you to feel good? I mean, who would want to do it if he didn't feel good? So is that our criteria? What's our criteria to measure whether something's true or not? What does the Bible say? Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you might prophesy. So of the gifts that we should desire, what gift does Paul say that we should especially focus on? prophecy. And prophecy, like I said, it's not talking about you're going around like Elijah or John the Baptist making predictions. Prophecy here in 1 Corinthians is a Greek word means to speak in behalf of someone else. means to preach or to share, to teach for Christ. It gives a prophecy. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God for no one understands him. However in the spirit he speaks mysteries. Okay, we got to stop here and explain something. Most of what Paul says about tongues is in 1 Corinthians. No. All of what Paul says about tongues is in 1 Corinthians. Paul wrote most of the New Testament. He only talks about tongues in one book, not even in 2 Corinthians. Matter of fact, Matthew never mentions tongues. John never mentions tongues. Luke never mentions tongues except in Acts. He doesn't in his gospel. Peter never mentions tongues. James never mentions tongues. And yet in spite of the silence of all these other Bible writers, if you go to many charismatic churches, you would think that that was all they talked about. And when the gifts of the Spirit are listed, they typically turn the list upside down where he talks about the most important gift is prophecy, the least important is tongues. Now, back to Corinth. Corinth was a booming new baby church that Paul had planted it's a seaport in the Roman Empire where it was a melting pot of people and slaves from all over the Roman Empire. Now, some of them had come from Northern Africa and some of them had maybe come from